Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you. We grow our grapes with the help of the insects and also the wildlife around. At the ballet, at the ballet. My parents were really relieved that I could say, I have a job post-grad for musical theater. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard, and this is Charlottesville Inside Out. I highly recommend if you could be happy doing anything else in the world, do it. It's probably going to be easier. I'm in the real world now. I'm working a gig. Costuming, scenic, lighting, sound. We're painting a, a beautiful portrait. Today we're going to check out a professional summer theater founded in 1974 that brings UVA students, staff, and faculty together to work alongside professional artists and community members. Join us as we catch up with Jenny Wales, actor, educator, and Heritage Theater Festival artistic director. Come on. Here we go. Five, six, five, six, seven, and second week. More advanced and we have to be a table, be a sports car, ice cream cone. For me, it was always a dream. Charlottesville has meant so much to me, and the university was really where uh, I was challenged to shape who I was as an artist, who I was as a human. And so when this job came up, it was, um, it was one of those once-in-a-lifetime opportunities because it was more than just a job. It was an opportunity for me to give back to the community that's given me so much. And my dad is an alum of the University of Virginia, and I am an alum of the University of Virginia. So Charlottesville and, and this university mean so much to me, so I'm hoping that I can incorporate and use that as fuel for moving the theater forward. What are you most excited to bring to the role of artistic director? One thing I was really focused on in my job at UNC Chapel Hill was finding those intersections between the work we produce on our stage and the work that's going on in classrooms, around grounds, and also in our community. So that's something that's really um, exciting to me is where can we find those intersections and uh, bolster those relationships? How and you're not talking just about theater classes. No. You're talking about every no, class. No, I'm, I'm talking about every class. I mean, I right. think that you know we use physics, we use math, we use science every day in the work that we're creating. And so finding yeah. those intersections is something that really, it, it excites me. Yeah, and you, and you serve as a professor here. I do, I do. I serve as a professor here during the academic year while planning for Heritage and then running Heritage in the summer. So I am, uh, I love working with students and I'm grateful every day to have that exchange um, with our students here. You did something this season that was really sort of a first in going out and holding auditions. Yeah, around, around yes, the country. We, we did, we did. You know, Charlottesville knows uh, the extraordinary work that's happening here at Heritage and uh, something I'm really focused on is ensuring that everyone knows uh, the extraordinary work that, that we're doing here in Charlottesville. So we held auditions in Charlottesville. Right. Um, in for, Washington, for a course For line, a course right? line. Okay. For a course line, we held auditions in Charlottesville, in Washington, D.C., and in New York City. And we saw over 400 actors, I believe. It was over 300 in one day in New York. And some of them had gotten there at 5.30 that morning. So that's oh when we goodness. knew um, definitively that Heritage is celebrated in the community, in our theatrical community, and it was thrilling to have that many actors uh, come and audition for us. Well, and also how sort of the irony of it that it, it basically was a chorus line. It was. It, it was, was a story. chorus line. So we would bring in about 35 women at a time um, to do a dance call. We did a dance call first, much like a chorus line. And definitely by the, you know, sixth group of 35 uh, dancer actors coming in, it 
felt like a chorus line. It felt wow. like Matt and I were in a chorus line making decisions really quickly. And um, you have a lot of empathy for the journey that artists put themselves on the line for. Right. To put yourself out there for such right. a short amount of time and you get the job or you don't get the job. So that music slows down and they mark it slower dull. You're one of 300 five foot half an inch girls in the room wearing a red t-shirt, but you just have to have hope that there's something special that'll set you apart that day. And if it doesn't set you apart that day, then you get the rest of the day off and you can go get yourself an ice cream. So I'm gonna be playing Zeppo or uh, Robert Jameson is the character's name. Um, working with Frank Ferrante, who's a director and actor, and uh, sort of the the Groucho Marx guy in the entire world, um, which is just so exciting to learn from someone with that kind of experience and uh, that kind of skill. Charlottesville has always made great art, and something that I wanted to do was try to spread that some and show you know New York what amazing art was going on in Charlottesville and at Heritage Theater Festival. You and Matt have history. You met at UVA. Talk we, about that. We did. So Matt Steffens, a director, choreographer of A Chorus Line, and I met our first week of our first year here at the University of Virginia. And we've worked together when we were students here at UVA. And then after we left and graduated, we've collaborated multiple times in our careers artistically. And yet this is the first time that we've been able to collaborate on a project here in Charlottesville, back at the university, oh. where it all began. So it's, it's pretty special for both of us. And that's what's so exciting, is that you have professional artists who are coming to Charlottesville and working here at the festival. Talk about how that must feel for other artists who are here, community members, students who are working side by side with them. It's a really thrilling thing. Everyone's learning from one another, and I think that, um, the, the people who join us in the summer bring something to Charlottesville that we wouldn't have otherwise. And the same goes for uh, the people here who live and work in Charlottesville right. to intersect with those professionals. Yeah. They're giving something specific as well. So it's a, it's a really beautiful combination. And I, and I love watching everyone intersect and work together. Well, and then how do you, how many shows do you do a season and how do you go about choosing which shows you do? Yeah, so we usually do about four shows a season. And choosing shows is something that um, is very important to me. There needs to be an intentionality um, mm -hmm. when you're choosing work. So he went, yes, I went. Yes, he yes, went. went. So I'm going to be some kindergarten teacher. Imagine me, this kindergarten teacher. No, of course, line was revolutionary in 1975. It was groundbreaking. It was a documentary piece of theater. These were actual stories of actual dancers uh, on the line. And I think what's beautiful about this piece is that no matter where you are in your life, mm -hmm. um, you can identify with someone and their story on the line. So mm -hmm. there's a universality in the story. It's also directly addressing issues of racism, misogyny, homophobia, things we're still struggling with today. Right, and I think right. it, it provides um, an entry point uh, for our audiences to have that combination of being entertained and challenged at the same time. Yes, everything is beautiful. What's, what's beautiful about theater is that you're sharing experiences with people um, and, you're, and you're really building something together in a super compressed amount of time so you get to know, work with and love these people, you know, in, in a matter of weeks. It's nice to be in a city where people stop and say hello to you or ask you how your day is when they're complete strangers. It's a very tight-knit, warm, welcoming community. And for me, it's been great just because I've been reminded of a bunch of things I love about the art and the craft that I had probably forgotten by being in the city so long. The Drama Education Building is a sort of a, an odd place in that it has to create an education environment for students during our academic year. But during the Heritage Theater Festival, we open up all three theaters. We can have a really high quality professional experience and then during the school year have a great environment for students. You know, for two hours, a group of people that might not ever come together ever again go on a collective experience together. And that's the joy of theater. This theater has such great history. So there's a part of you I know that wants to continue tradition, but at the same time, move it in your own direction. So how do you, how do, you do that? I think it's a balance. 
Right. Um, I'm a different artist and a different person than anyone who has been here before, and that will influence the decisions that I make and um, my programming and 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 how we move things forward. But it's it's a tricky thing. There's been a lot of talk about change, and change for me is um. You it's don't a use difficult, that I word. don't use that word. What is your word? It's a difficult world. I like to use shift. Shift. I it's like shift. to use shift because yeah. there are things that I think when people hear change, it's um, it's shocking, it's overwhelming, and it's not that I am moving the theater in, in a radical direction, in a different way that doesn't honor what it's been. I'm trying to take my skill set and my life experience and bring that to where Heritage is now. And with such a appreciation of the school and Heritage yes. and the community, you yes. have that. I do, I do. And so what does it take to run a professional theater? I mean, you tell us about <laughs> your team, because you have, you have a huge team, you have to have a team. First of all, no one does it alone. <laughs> I mean, it is an incredible team. Everyone is working at the top of their um, ability and is pulling really long hours and has bought into the idea that what we do is making an impact. So I think to run a theater, you need patience mm -hmm. and generosity and flexibility and uh, a sense of humor. One and two and three and four. We're all lucky in this building to produce theater and to create art that we trust has an impact not only on ourselves but more importantly on our community. And the hours are long and things can get stressful as in any job and so I do think that it's really important that we're all aware of um, how lucky we are to do what we do. and to have that sense of humor kind of guiding us through those moments when y you may not feel like you want to have that sense of humor. <laughs> well, and, and it, it's not an easy life, theater and acting. It's just, it's not. So why do you do it? Why do you pull the long hours? I've made this my world because I believe that uh, theater has the ability to expand our understanding of our shared humanity. And it is, it's a very specific a life, you know, to choose and career to choose, but I believe strongly that the work that we're doing uh, makes a difference. There's something that's singular about being in a theater or being in a concert hall. There's something about the arts that um, is transformative. I've learned that my worst days as an actor are better than my best days doing anything else. I'm going into this life knowing that it is not a life of consistent employment, but I would rather have spotty short-term jobs doing exactly what I want to be doing on this earth versus a long-term job of something that doesn't fit my heart. I know that I always try to challenge myself in the way that I approach a piece and challenge my cast and challenge the audiences and maybe the piece that we're working on can present them a different view of the world and I think in the end that brings us all together. Working on the vineyard makes you feel invested in the vineyard and like, come see my vineyard. And then I also enjoy tasting. That's really not part of the wine club. Although we do have awesome lunches. We're gonna call it four hours. So you're not in the club yet, Seth. <laughs> we were too fast. We were a victim of our own success. Growing grapes in Virginia can be difficult due to the humid climate. Growing certified organic grapes can be almost impossible. Today we're going to talk with one of the few winemakers on the East Coast who is working to beat these odds. Join us as we visit with Carl Hampsch of Loving Cup Vineyard and Winery. Come on! So today we're just going to start at the top of our list and work our way down. This is the Loving Cup White. We came to see about the sangria, but understanding that the season is over, um, so we found that there's some other seasonal wines that we thought were exquisite. So we were in the area and we found Loving Cup. We like, really liked that they were organic and wanted to try out the uh, different grapes. I'm not quite the wine expert, so I can't say it in really flowery terms, but they have very unique wines and it's because they sort of do things a different, certain way. Loving Cup is a Rolling Stone song. 
we wanted to reference the organicness of the vineyard. And so we thought that putting a little more love into what we do, you know, a little more love in the glass or in the cup, thought that would be a good name for us. What constitutes certified organic? Technically, organic is without the use of synthetic materials. That includes fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, so we don't use any of those synthetics. Three quarters of the disease fighting is the vine's inherent disease resistance. And then right. last quarter is, is what we do. So shoot positioning, leaf pulling, uh, all canopy management in order to keep the whole thing uh, open and airy. Um, if we miss any handwork, then we usually have an increase in diseases. And if you were walking around the vineyard and you saw something, and what would it look like? What would you remove? Most of them will have some sort of necrotic spots, but each disease presents the symptoms differently. We don't have the ability uh, to spray away our problems. Right. Um, so we're just collecting bad leaves or bad shoots and we're removing from the vineyard. So why? Why did you go in this direction? I've heard you describe it as farming with two hands behind your back. Yeah, yeah. So why? We didn't initially plan on growing grapes commercially. Now this was just something that my dad and I did. We were making wine from his, from fruit from his garden. Along the way we had decided that we didn't want to grow grapes and have to spray them a lot and it turns out you do. So we chose varieties that we would not have to spray those synthetic materials on and if we happen to get these these sprays on us I'm not afraid of them in the washing machine you know yeah with with my daughter's clothes. You know. Well I didn't join this club for the benefits per se I really just love the fact that it's an organic vineyard and I really really like Carl and everybody that's involved with with the vineyard. It's just a friendly place to come. Probably, I mean, I first came here because it was organic and I thought that was interesting and how could it be organic and no one else is. And then I really appreciate working in the field that it's organic. One intriguing part is that we put little paper bags on the clusters to prevent spread of disease and that's a really tedious task but according to the results has been pretty helpful. We normally go out and we, we pull disease out, but this year it was so much rain, there was so much disease that we, we couldn't get it out fast enough. I hope that the 2018 season is just simply a blip 20 years from now. We'll say, wow, we learned a lot, uh, as opposed to 2018 being, you know, the season that, that took us down. It's just another challenge and, and, and hopefully we have everything in place to overcome it. Talk about the role that insects play out here in the vineyard. We tolerate probably more insects in the vineyard than, than most because we rely on them. Ladybugs, spiders, praying mantises, those are really big ones. They are constantly eating smaller insects. The way we treat our pest insects is don't kill them, which sounds sort of counterintuitive, but you know, if you are killing your insects, then you aren't providing food for your beneficials. So the only thing we actually try to reduce are caterpillars. Oh, that's great. I would love to go to the tasting room. Can we go check out the wines in the tasting room? Yeah, let's taste some wine. Okay. Come on. So may I try that of one? Thank you. May I taste with you? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Crisp and dry. Oh, that's nice. That's really nice. Thank you. How do people know that this is really certified organic. The vineyard got certified first in 2012 before our first harvest, and the winery was certified a few years later in 2016. And because both the ingredients and the, the winery, the facility that makes the wine, those are both organic, then you can qualify for organic labeling. So how does the customer know it's organic? Because the word organic is on the label. Oh, right. And it's really hard to do. Every year you get inspected, every year right. you send in a very long application, and for us it's two long applications because it's both the vineyard and the winery. You've been doing this since 2007, 2008 was when you started playing with grapes and 2014 was when you opened the tasting room. Correct. So your goal every year, I, I imagine, grows. How many, how many cases of wine are you setting as a goal for this year? We probably were in the neighborhood of about 500 cases, so we're tiny. I mean, Virginia's tiny on the world scale, yeah. um, and we're tiny even on the Virginia scale. So eventually, we probably could max out at 1,500. And then you have this incredible wine club. Talk, it's very different from any wine club I've ever heard of. We have potentially the most exclusive wine club in the state. <laughs> um, 
you can't buy your way in, you have to work your way in. Yeah. And they get a, they get a 25% discount. Yeah, they, they get the family discount, which is nice. And a lot of them are really interested in, in growing grapes and maybe especially in learning how to grow organic grapes. You guys are so yeah, fast. All these are I want everyone to come back when we do the red. I've been a club member for about three years. And the reason why is I love this vineyard. I love the wine. I love the fact that it's organic. My first thing was um, running grapes through the press. And I worked in the field planting and harvesting and bagging and leaf pulling and pruning. And today we're bottling. So I was in charge of like putting the cork on the wine bottle, uh, which is the, I think the most intense labor activity. I'm the only college student working here, so it was great to sort of meet a couple other locals who've been doing this for years. When we get to this point, we need to look at what our level is in the tank to see if like we need to do more right away or not. In a perfect world, we finish by lunchtime. I love working with Carl. He's very knowledgeable about what he does, and he's a very good teacher. So, you know, even if we're just coming for half a day on a Saturday, he really explains everything that we're doing and why. I think what's really cool about it is the attention to detail. And it's so important that as soon as one person finishes something, it's going to someone and they're immediately doing it. Because, for example, if the bottle with wine in it isn't immediately corked, then the wine's exposed to air and it loses some of its like taste and texture. Look at this adorable label. Tell me, what is, what is this wine? The rosé that we make every year is called the Dudley Nose Rosé. If a dog is born with a pink nose, it's called a Dudley Nose. And a percentage of this particular wine goes to a local animal shelter. Yeah, so the partnership we have with the shelter is they provide us every year with a picture of a dog that's been adopted through the shelter that has a Dudley nose. And every year we give them $2 from every bottle we sell. We are able then to maybe raise the profile of their, their work. Yeah. All right, well, let's try that sure. one. And this, I've been told, is very popular. Yeah, if we had to pick a, a crowd favorite, it would be this. I mean, I've toyed with not making any red wine and just making rosé. Uh, it's the same red wine grapes that we use to make the red wine. It's just a different process. Or do I do that? Yeah, that's it. It's the trick is don't get it to right, spill out. To... It helps if you set it on the table. That's really yummy. I thought that I didn't like rosés because of the reputation they had decades ago. You know, really sweetsy. Mm -hmm. But this is... This is really nice. Tell me about the logo, too. The shield and the heart are the mm -hmm. central elements of the uh, crest for my, my dad's hometown. Before we even had a name that we could trademark, we were putting our, a logo, a working logo, on bins and stuff so we could make our first vintage. We had no concept that our eventual name would actually loosely correspond to the logo we had temporarily chosen. Okay, what is this one? Uh, Tellurian Red, uh, that's our our foray into making like reserve wine. Our goal every year is to have it in, in a bar aged in a barrel that has previously had whiskey in it. Right. Um, so you get the flavor of the whiskey, the flavor right. of the barrel. Right, yeah. yeah. So now that the winery is certified organic, um, we can't just go out on the open market and get bourbon barrels because the, there's about a gallon of wine or spirits or beer, whatever used to be in that barrel is right. still absorbed in the wood. We uh, now are partnering with Catoctin Creek and uh, they make a certified organic rye whiskey. So we can make this wine now that we're certified. We thought that we might have to stop making this. So being organic certainly makes things more complicated mm -hmm. um, than just being super flexible and saying, oh yeah, we're gonna try this. I have a problem, I'm gonna go do it. Every time we encounter something, we have to make sure we can do it <laughs> right. before we do it. And then what is on, oh, you have apple wine. Yeah, yeah, this, this was something we had no intention of doing. A lot of these things that are just sort of surprises um, where we were contacted at the end of the season by a certified organic apple orchard in Northern Virginia. And um, even though apple wine was the very first wine my dad and I ever made, um, we made it on such a small scale that we didn't know how to make it on a large scale. So it was a learning process, but um, it was a delightful surprise in how it turned out. And based on the success of making a no-sulfite apple wine, we're gonna try that with grapes next year. It's clearly a tricky job when you go certified organic. So. Where do you see yourselves in the future? And, um, and, and what are your goals? Our goals are to grow grapes this way. 
And at the end, if we've done our job the right way, then the wines taste good. I don't see us having a huge vineyard or a huge winery because we're just so labor intensive out there. And if we grew more grapes than, than we could manage, then the wines wouldn't be very good. So we might have some growth, but we have to have balance the whole way. And so um, I don't just like to maintain, um, you know, keep doing what we're doing. Well, it's a special place and we really appreciate you having us out here today. Thank you for visiting, Terry. Favorite today was the uh, white sangria that they had. Uh, it was a mixture of their uh, white wine and their apple flavored wine. And so it was really great to have a fall warm drink. The tastings were more focused on the seasonal taste. Uh, and that seasonal taste is cinnamon and it's apple and it's delicious and it's Virginia apples, which we love. The owners are marvelous people. It's a great little spot. It's cozy. The people are really friendly. The wine's really tasty. And I would really recommend coming. To you guys. Cheers. Job well done. Cheers. 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 Mm. Oh, it's good. The dream team. That's it for this week. For WHTJ, I'm Terry Allard. Join us next time on Charlottesville Inside Out. Charlottesville Inside Out is made possible thanks in part to its patrons, committed to supporting the people, places, and quality of life that uniquely define Charlottesville and its surroundings, and by viewers like you. Thank you.